about that more in the weeks ahead. All right, so let's get into the Word of God this morning. I, I don't know that I have, I don't know how to say this, I don't know how more expressive I could get than this. This week is Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. It was the beginning of Jesus' final week of earthly ministry before he passed it to us. And it's so much that happens in this week. I mean, you've got today, which was his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And tomorrow is the day he cleansed the temple. And then later in the week, you have uh, his time with the disciples and you have the betrayal and then you have the arrest and crucifixion on, you know, Good Friday, his death, but then his resurrection next Sunday. There is so much that happened in that seven days. It was all the most critical. And, you know, it's like I love Christmas time. Christmas is fantastic, but I don't get nearly as excited or nostalgic, if I can say that, at Christmas as I do Easter. Like for me, Christmas is a lot of memories of my family. Uh, it's memories of even my family who's now growing older and all of the years we've spent with our kids at Christmas and uh, times with our church family, even now with you, we've had our first Christmas together and hopefully many more. And, but there's nothing like Easter. I don't think about me much at Christmas. Even the Shopping isn't about me, right? I'm even making lists for other people, and I make Christmas cards for other people. But Easter is a time where, for me, I think a lot about my relationship with Jesus. It's different. It's just a different, different week. And so as we're going into today, you know, this is a very prophetic week. There was so much that was said. If you go into Zechariah 9 and you can read about the prophecy of Palm Sunday, uh, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, you can read about all these prophecies of this week. Uh, but I, again, just the kind of thinker I am, just the way I process my relationship with Jesus, uh, I don't st stop and just think about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Because it's not like Jesus just woke up uh, on one morning, was like, you know what? I think tomorrow I'll make that last journey into Jerusalem and start my last week. And let's, let's do it next week. Next week's a good week. Let's do that, right? That wasn't how he did it. It wasn't last minute. It wasn't, it wasn't spontaneous. It was planned. It was thought out. And not only was it planned ahead of time, it was planned from the moment that sin took place. This was the full posture and attention of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit was this week. And so just the kind of thinker I am, the kind of person, the way I consider that, I think of what does that look like leading up to Palm Sunday? What was that time like? What did Jesus do? What are the last things that he emphasized before he started his last week of earthly ministry, because so much of what he did in that week, it was prophesied. It was set. He was walking through it right down to this day, the, the donkey he rode in on. I mean, everything was already prophesied about and it was already put in place. And he was just executing those prophecies and going through uh, everything that needed to be done. But everything before it, like, I don't know, my wife, how many times have we moved across the Atlantic Ocean? I don't know, five times, something like that. We've crisscrossed the Atlantic and made transatlantic moves. I think this is our fifth one. And I'm just telling you, we don't decide the week before. You know what I mean? Like a lot of you have made, most of the people in here can identify, you've made these big international moves before, and it, the plan starts. Like you're thinking, what can I take? What can I not take? You know, for our family, there's, we move in these big tubs and we got to weigh each one. They can't be more than a certain weight. So we sat down with the kids. They're like, all right, you get only a certain amount of stuff. And so they got, they start with this big pile and we're looking at it. We're like, yeah, you're going to get about 10% of that. So figure it out, decide what's most important. And there's, it's a process. It's a huge process. Jesus had a process long before he got to Jerusalem on the donkey, 
There were things that were happening. I call it the final road. I call it the final road. Now, I can't possibly teach the entire final road in one sermon. So I do have a focus. I do have a focus this morning on the final road. What were some things that happened? But there was a moment, okay? There was a moment where Jesus said, it's time to start heading to Jerusalem. It's recorded. Let's look at it. It's in Luke chapter 5, or excuse me, Luke chapter 9. They have it on the screens. It's Luke chapter 9, and it's starting in verse 51, and it says this, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. There it is. That's the moment. That's the exact moment where Jesus said, stop what we're doing. We're heading out. We're going back. As a matter of fact, I know this is, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but could you pull up the map, the actual map? So this is the map. So you'll see that up at the top there, sorry, it's a little small. Uh, that's where Jesus was at in in Luke 9, 51, he was in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee when he said, okay, let's start to make that final journey. We're heading back to Jerusalem. Now, no one around him understood the significance of chapter 9, verse 51. They thought, oh, okay, so we're going to start making our way back. I mean, they're a long way from Jerusalem. And no one realized what was happening, but Jesus knew exactly what that meant. So even though we have days like today, Palm Sunday, where we say, well, this was the start of his last week of earthly ministry. For Jesus, it's Luke chapter 9, verse 51. He was on the journey when no one else knew what was going on. And that's how far that they were now going to travel. And there were an incredible amount of events that had taken place that are significant. But I want to focus in on one very a specific thread of events, all right? So let's look at that, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It says, when the days were approaching his ascension. Now stop there. You know what's fascinating about that right there, the way Luke records it? He doesn't say, as the days were approaching for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. No. He doesn't say, as the days are approaching for his arrest and betrayal. No. Nope. As the days were approaching that he would be crucified, hung on a cross. Nope. As the days were approaching that he would die. Nope. As the days were approaching that he would raise from the dead. Nope. As the days were approaching of his ascension, Jesus determined towards Jerusalem. What does this mean? Ascension means that he was dead he came back to life and then he spent about 40 days on earth after he rose from the dead appearing to different people giving some last instructions proven that he was alive meeting with people and then after 40 days of that he ascended So Jesus, way back in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, way up in Capernaum, it says, all right, I'm getting close to my ascension. I'm getting close to when this is all done. And that's the moment that I'm going to empower these guys to do the work that I have done. That they are going to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they are going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus was most excited about. As, oh man, my ascension's coming up. They're going to do it. And they're going to reach millions of people. They're going to reach hundreds of millions of people. They're going to reach billions of people. And the scripture says, all men will gain access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is starting to posture himself towards Jerusalem. And we get excited about the triumphal entry, which is cool. But Jesus was like, I'm talking about when I go up and the Holy Spirit comes in and then you go to the ends of the earth. That's what he was most excited about. Think about that. 
So again, I'm not, I'm not trying to dilute this week. Please understand, I'm not saying that. I'm just giving you Jesus' perspective. All right, let's pick it up. Let's keep reading. Luke 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 51, going into verse 52. And Jesus sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and they entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. So he's, he's saying, okay, we're going all the way back to Jerusalem, so we're going to need people to go ahead of us to find places to sleep, maybe arrange food, you know, kind of go out ahead and get things set up. And they go to a Samaritan village to make these arrangements because it was a village they were going to need to pass through, verse 53. But they did not receive Jesus because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. Now, I'm not going to go into it, but the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along because they had a different opinion on what the holy city was. They had, they had an old problem. Samaritans used to be part of Israel. And they're like, you're going to Jerusalem. And they knew the holidays that were coming up. They're like, no, you're not staying here. You go stay somewhere else. Right? But look at verse 54. When his disciples, naming them, wow, talk about getting outed for all eternity, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I mean, what's up with that? I mean, I mean, they are forever attached. Luke didn't even bother to say some of the disciples. He actually named them. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Amen. Let's pause here. If you notice in that passage of Scripture, they didn't say, Jesus, you know what? You should call on heaven and have fire come down and kill these people. They didn't say that. They said, Jesus, do you want us? to call on fire, to come down from heaven and kill these Samaritans? Now, why would, where, where are they getting that from? Well, the audacity, you know? The reason that they said that was because a few days before, Jesus sent them out in his power and in his name, and they did perform miracles. And so we got some power drunk disciples. And they're thinking that there's something now. Well, look at us. We can do these things. Jesus, step aside. I've got this one. I am going to murder people. See how messed up we get? That's just, that's just wrong. That's just, that's what Jesus is like. What's, what are you talking about? What spirit of, do you know what's going? You don't get it. Sit down. You don't get it. Now, why is Jesus, kind of, he's being pretty strong. He rebukes them. That's a strong piece of language. But he rebuked them for it because they're so immature about it. But I kind of look at Jesus like, well, you know, they just don't know yet. Why are you being so direct with them? Why? It's a little harsh. But I'm going to tell you why Jesus was harsh with them. Because if they couldn't handle some disrespectful Samaritans, how are they ever going to handle murderous Jews? Because that's where they were going. See, Jesus knew that. They didn't know that. Jesus knows we're going to Jerusalem because I need to be murdered. And I need to be killed in a, the most gruesome possible way. I need to be ridiculed. I mean to be disgraced. I need to be shamed. I need to be murdered. And these guys, this whole time they're walking with Jesus, it's kind of one of those things like no one's ever touched him in, in a violent way. They tried to kill, people tried to kill Jesus. Just before that, they were in Nazareth and they were gonna, they were gonna try to push Jesus off the mountain. And they couldn't do it. So they don't get what's about to happen. This final road is Jesus walking to his murder that God is going to allow. And so Jesus is saying, if you can't handle this kind of little disrespect, you better check because it's going to get nasty. It's going to be the worst you've ever seen. Your mind cannot imagine how gruesome this is going to get. And you're going to think that I was abandoned by God. So you need to figure it out. So Jesus seems to have leveled up in his seriousness about what they're doing because he knows this is the final road. But let's read on. Verse 57. 
As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, well, the foxes have holes and the birds have, they have nests, but the son of man, he doesn't have anywhere to stay. And he said to another, follow me. And that person said, Lord, permit me first to go and, and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury the dead. As far as you, you, you go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. And another also said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said, no. After putting his hands to the plow and looking back, that person is unfit for the kingdom of God. Luke has decided that in the moment that Jesus said, I'm turning my determination towards Jerusalem. Now, do you get that? That word is important. Because I'm not, you know, you can determine people. I can be determined. We can see children be really determined. But we're talking about the creator of all things is determination. This is a bit different. When Jesus and, and Luke 9, 51 turned to Jerusalem and said, I am determined to get there, that kind of trip isn't going to be for the wishy-washy. This kind of trip isn't going to be just for anybody. He's just not walking off to another miracle in another city, and he's not just seemingly meandering about Israel. He is determined to get to Jerusalem because this is the moment that him and his father have been working towards for thousands of years. We are going to fix eternal death. We are going to take the power back of sin and death. We are going to finally get this thing done for all eternity, and you can't come with me if you want to go kiss your girlfriend before you go. If you're going to do this thing, if you're going to be on my final road, you got to level up. Again, they don't know that, but Jesus knows. It was on this same road that we had that interaction we talked about a couple weeks ago about the, the rich young ruler. That's why Jesus was like, go sell everything. Give it to the poor. No, nah, I can't do that. Then you can't go where I'm going. You can't go where I'm going. I want you to come where I'm going. But you ain't ever going to make it. You're going to bail somewhere along the process, and I can't have that. Let's keep reading. I want to read back. I want to go back and I want to read that bottom part again. He says, but Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hands to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, there is anything worse than you go. Remember I talked about a couple weeks ago, going this way and be like, oh, I'll catch up. I'm going to go do this for a minute. Jesus is like, I ain't going to be here when you come back. I am determined. It is predetermined. It has been decided. I was miraculously born through the Virgin Mary to do this thing. So I don't have time for that. And all along the way, Jesus is still trying to make disciples. Think about that. It, it wasn't just people, because my thing is, is Luke records it this way. It's interesting because, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a guess, but I really, I think I can say this. I'm sure that all along the way of Jesus' ministry, there was lots of people saying, hey, can I come? For lots of motives. There's people who are like, wow, this is amazing. This guy's healing people. Like, I don't know if this guy's a wacko or not, but this is going to be remembered in history. I want to be a part of that. There's people that are glory hunters. Well, I'm going to go hang out in Jesus and look cool and be a part of this, but at the end of the day, I'm still just wanting to do my own thing. But I'll just hang out for a minute because I want to say that I was there. Like, there was all kinds of people coming around, but Luke takes this moment to record how stern Jesus was with people who were wanting to follow him. He was willing to take them because he even said to the one person, follow me. He was still making disciples. He was still making 
disciples. Now, can we pull the map back up? This map, this one's a good one. So you can see how far they traveled. Now, I'm not going to talk about all this other stuff, but if you look down here, they get all the way down to Jericho. Jericho was an eight hour plus walk to Jerusalem. All right? I want to go into Jericho. I want to plant here for a second. I want to pull some things out that happened in Jericho that are important. Because the thread that we're talking about on the final road is the final road in Jesus' relationship with disciples. Okay? So they get all the way down to Jericho. So I want to I pause and I want to get to Jericho. So let's go to Luke chapter 19. So they get all the way to Jericho. Let's pick this up, starting in verse 1. It says this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Okay, so he's entering Jericho. So he's just walking in. All right? I also want to point out something. It hit my heart when I taught this in first service. I didn't say it. He entered Jericho and was passing through. It reads like Jesus' intentions was just to keep going. Okay? He enters Jericho and was passing through. Verse 2. And there was a man called Zacchaeus. He's a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, but was unable because of the crowd, and he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree, and in order to see Jesus, or in order to see Jesus, for he was about to pass through that way. Verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and he said to Zacchaeus in the tree, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay in your house. I read that as though Jesus made an adjustment to the plan. He could not have gotten all the way to Jerusalem for the triumphal entry in that day, but he could have got all the way to Bethany or something just outside. But now he said, hey, I'm going to stay at your house. And Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble and complain. He has gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give them four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. All right, let's get into this. There's some things going on here. He's coming into Jericho. And here's this guy, Zacchaeus. He's a tax collector, which means he's rich, which also means he's rich on the backs of the people in his community. It's a tough, it's a, that's a tough relationalist situation. You're working hard and he's crazy repping you off with bad taxes and he's getting rich and he's got this big house. And here comes Jesus and all these people are like, hey, we want to hang out with you. We want to be with you. We're, we're gathering. I stay in my house. But Jesus stays with this guy. Well, what do you mean? I bought that house for him. That's, that's our house. He stole from us, and you're going to go sleep in that house. Why on earth, of everything that's going on, and Jesus is going into the big final week, that he's going to go stay at Zacchaeus' house. Well, there's something there that I want to point out. When Jesus was walking in, Zacchaeus climbed a tree, and it says Jesus came and he looked up. Now, right there in our natural, we're like, well, of course he looked up, Kurt. He was in a tree. True. It was very, very true. Except when you do the word study, it shows us something that's a little more interesting than that. And a blepo, it means to recover to look up. You say, well, okay, that's exactly what you just said. It means to look up. Stop trying to make something out of nothing, right? So what's interesting about this word? This word is only used in Scripture as it relates to supernatural events. Like when Jesus had the bread, he looked up to heaven and a blepo broke it and then that was the, the miraculous feeding. This was the word whenever he healed a blind person and they gained sight. This was the word that was used. So it was always used in a miraculous sense. 
not just for blindness, but for things that Jesus did when he looked up to heaven. He was activating the supernatural ability, okay? Jesus looked up, and Ablepo, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. All right, and you say, well, yeah, but right there, like that's not a, that's not a supernatural context. Is it? Watch. Luke 21, one through three is the second time that this word was used in a seemingly non-miraculous way. But this is the story. It says, and Jesus looked up, and Ablepo, and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. So what Jesus just showed us is he has a prophetic discernment that he could look at a, wi a widow putting in the smallest amount of money next to a rich guy putting in a ton of money and be able to determine who actually gave. Anna Bleppo. It was Jesus' prophetic discernment, his ability to look into the motives of a person's heart. So every time this word is used, it's used in a supernatural or spiritual gifting sense. Every time. So when he looked up, Jesus is walking in, and Zacchaeus climbs up there, and he's up on that railing right there, and he walks in, and Jesus looked up. He, Anableppo, he looked up and said, I see the motive of your heart, Zacchaeus, and you're just not trying to get a look at me. You're trying to know me. Get down. I'm going to go to your house. And salvation happened at that house. Everybody, no one else was doing that. The crowd that was gathering, they were not trying to know Jesus. They wanted something. They wanted something. They had their hands out. They wanted, a, they wanted a moment. They wanted a selfie. You know what I mean? Like they're trying to get, hey, I was there. But Zacchaeus, rich, and Jesus' teaching was against Zacchaeus' lifestyle. And he climbed the tree because he's like, there's something about this guy. I want to know him. And Jesus heard that in the spirit and a blepo. And he said, come down here. You and I are going to talk. Now, the next morning. So this happened. He stays at Zacchaeus' house, teaches. Go to Mark 10. Mark 10. Mark 10. So this is the next day, and Jesus is leaving Jericho. This is, this is the morning. He's going to Jerusalem. He's heading for the triumphal entry. And you would think, I don't know, he wakes up and you're like, I don't want to see or talk to anybody. I'm just, I got to get there. We're, I'm determined to get there. I'm going to go. Of course, Jesus, that doesn't happen. Look at this. Look at Mark 10. This is as Jesus is leaving, right? Mark 10. Let me make sure I got it. Verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me! Exclamation point. All right, so... Mind. Can you see that? He's crying out. Verse 48, many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's calling you. So everybody knows this is the thing that Jesus does. You're going to get healed. So hurry up. And Bartimaeus, it says, he throws off of his cloak. He throws his cloak to the side. He jumped up and he came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? All right, let's just pause it. Okay. 
right, I'm just saying, if I'm there and I'm sitting out here and there's a, this blind man who's a beggar, is crying out and you call on him and he comes over, why, what, are you gonna ask him what he needs? I mean, isn't it kind of obvious? I'm like, if I was there, that's what I'd have said to my buddy. Seriously? Like probably sarcastically, a little bit maybe of a jerk move, like, why are you, he's blind. Obviously he needs his, his sight back. You know, like, why are you asking that question? But of course it's Jesus. So something's going on. Because he doesn't add bad he doesn't ask bad questions. He's going somewhere. He's determined. And his question is part of his journey. And he says to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, I want you to regain my sight. Exclamation point. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following on the road. All right, let's go. Time out. Get that in your mind. He comes to Jesus. What do you want from me? I want to regain my sight. You're healed. Awesome story. What's going on here? First off, gosh, I want to say this right. Let's say it like this. Everybody's telling blind Bartimaeus to be quiet. Matter of fact, that word, and if you go into Matthew's account of this, they actually rebuked him. And I'm just, when I read that, I say, what? This guy's blind. He's a beggar. Jesus is known for being a special, you know, compassionate guy towards blind beggars. I mean, why would you tell this guy to, to be quiet? Why would you rebuke him? Like, do you really need to be seen that bad that you think this guy's doing something wrong? This is, this is what's cool about this. So. Bartimaeus wasn't just crying out to Jesus, hey, Jesus, come and give me my sight. Jesus, give me something. He wasn't doing that. You know what he said to him? He said, Jesus, son of David. That was a prophetic utterance reserved only for the future Messiah. So, Way back in King David's time, there was a prophecy and it said that of King David's line, his family will be the forever king. And it was always understood among all the Jewish people that that meant that that would be the Messiah. So here's Bartimaeus. He's not saying, Jesus, do something good for me. I'm a blind guy. I'm living on a street side. Just give me something on your way through town. No, Bartimaeus was proclaiming the Messiahship of Jesus, and people were saying, you can't say that. I rebuke what you're saying. Get out of my face. You are the son of David. Amen. That's why Jesus stopped and said, well, call him here. This is not the situation we thought it was. This is a moment, because Jesus didn't have very many people calling him the Messiah at this point. Call him here. Now, it's funny, to try to elevate this for us, to give us some sort of context, I was thinking about this this morning. In our sad little worlds of sports entertainment, we have these silly little arguments that actually get pretty heated online. Like, who is the greatest footballer of all time? Ronaldo or Messi? Pe oh, see, someone's got an opinion. Hey, right now, a lot of you are like, oh, that's Messi for sure. I don't even know why we're even bringing this up. But it gets heated. We have it in the States as well with the NBA, LeBron or Jordan, you know. This right here is a guy saying, that's the greatest of all time. 
There is no one else. This is the Messiah. This is him. This is, you are son of David. And everybody around him is like, what are you doing right now? You don't get to take that back. Bring him here. Now, what happens? Jesus says to him, what do you want from me? It means something different now. Because Jesus was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You get it. You see it. You're willing to risk your life because people could have likely killed this guy for saying that. And Jesus is like, bring him here. And he comes over and he's like, you get it. You know who I am. So you're not just interested in seeing things. What do you want? You're operating at a different level of faith. You're operating in a different level of commitment and understanding. And because of that, what do you want? Everybody else is like, well, my foot hurts. Um, I'm hungry. And this, Jesus is like, great, that's, I understand that. But this guy is now one of mine because he's confessed my messiahship. And I'm talking to him. What do you want from me? relationship different so me the sarcastic guy in the crowd I don't get it but that guy Bartimaeus and Jesus were having a moment so what happens what does he get what do you want from me and the blind man said to Jesus rabbi I want to regain my sight what do you think that word is anablepo it isn't just, I want to be able to see stuff. Hey, can I get my physical ability to see again so I can have a job? He actually looked at Jesus and said, I want an ablepo. Oh, you want to matter. You want purpose. Because he had heard then, he, he's in Jericho, everybody knew what was going on. And when Jesus walked into Jericho, he had Anableppo and he looked up at that man in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, I see you. I see your heart. I see your motive. I see your intention. Come down here. Let's get together. And blind Bartimaeus is over there saying, I don't want to just see. I want to do that. I want to be able to look at people and say, I see you. He's saying, Jesus, I want purpose. I want a ministry. I want a spiritual ability. Jesus, I want to do what you do. I don't want to just get healed and go get a job. I want to live. I want to matter. I want an ablepo. And Jesus said, well, your faith has just given you that. And immediately he gained Anableppo. And what did he do? Now we read about it in other parts of the scripture. Jesus healed somebody. He picked up his mat and he went home. And this person went away rejoicing. What did blind Bartimaeus do? He regained his sight and began following on the road. Blind Bartimaeus with his brand new sight did not go home. He did not go to get a job. He did not go to see loved ones that he hasn't seen because he regained sight. He had sight and he lost sight. See, most, most times when, when people would go through that in that time, they were considered outcasts, that they were cursed and they were kicked out. You're not allowed to interact with us. You've done something and you've deserved this. He's not going home to say, I'm going to make this right. Curse is lifted. I'm going to go see my kids. I haven't seen them. I want to go see my house, my wife, maybe my mom's still alive. He didn't want to see anybody. He's like, I'm going with this guy. I have sight. I have ministry. And I'm going with this guy. Worship team, if you'd come. Bartimaeus wasn't just healed. He was healed, saved, and sent. Now, you could say, Pastor, it uh, feels like a little bit of a stretch. How do we know? All right, let me, let me show you something. This is cool. Let me show you something. 
This story appears in the Synoptic Gospels. So let me do a little quick Bible thing for you. Okay, so the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right? The first three of those are called Synoptic because they're similar. They borrowed from each other. You get a lot of the same stories. This story is in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. Okay? Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew walked with Jesus. He was there. He was there that day. And so when he wrote his gospel, it was based on firsthand experience. Everything that went on, he was there. Mark and Luke were not there. They got saved later. They got added to the church later. And they wrote those gospels based on interviews, stories. And they collected all that and they wrote it out. So they're a little bit different, not conflicting, just emphasized differently. I want to take you to Matthew. This is not on the screens. I'm take you to Matthew. This is Matthew's account of Bartimaeus. All right, let's read it. It's Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 29. It says this. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed Jesus and two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. It's two. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? So it wasn't one, it was two. They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Okay. So Matthew was there. And Matthew says there were two blind people. The same exact thing happened. It just happened to two people. But when Matthew records it, he doesn't record it as Bartimaeus. He, does, he doesn't name him. Why is that? Blind or sick people that were beggars, they were low class. And they often would not record their names. But Matthew, Matthew was a senior. When Matthew wrote his gospel, he was a senior leader in the church. He walked with Jesus. He saw all this stuff. He was there. So when he wrote about it, he was like, yeah, there was these two blind men and Jesus healed them and da 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 and they went with them. Because Matthew's stories are senior. He's not going to necessarily name Bartimaeus because he saw a lot of that. But Mark and Luke, they came later. And because they came later, there were people that were saved and healed in the early days that were now their senior. So let me explain. This is what this is telling us. All right, Matthew records it. This happened to this guy, no name. Mark and Luke get saved later. And now they're saying this happened to Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, which is now they're saying, I'm gonna tell you the story of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, because he's somebody around here. He's become a senior guy that is an influencer in the early church. But Matthew's over here is like, yeah, I, re I remember that, but I'm, I, ran, I ran with Jesus. I ran with Peter. I was Levi, I got saved. I... What this is revealing to us is when Bartimaeus said, Aleppo, I wanna see, but I want ministry. It's indicating to us that ministry is exactly what he got and he was faithful with it. What happened to the blind guy number two? He's not mentioned by Mark and Luke, which means he never turned out to be anybody. This is what I wanted to take Palm Sunday to talk to you about. It's a beautiful story, Jesus riding on a donkey and getting celebrated going into Jerusalem. It's a powerful story. But I think Jesus wants you to know this. 
it's time for you to have a powerful story too. You'll never be senior. Jesus is senior. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no one, and there is no way to the Father but through him. He is sinless. He conquered sin and death. He went to hell, put his foot on the neck of Satan, and took back the power of sin and death. Nobody could do that. But now he is ascended and saying, who will be? Who's going to follow me now? So this is my question to you. Are you the disciples way up in Capernaum from the beginning of my, my message? I got power of God and I've got senior in this church and I lead a ministry and I ain't got time for you. I ain't got time to tell people about Jesus. I ain't got time for my neighbors. I got things to do. I am senior. I could call down the fire of heaven if I want. Is that you? Are you the other guys that said, hey, I want to come with you, Jesus, but you know what? I got to go kiss my girlfriend first. I have a life back here too, Jesus. I'll come as far as halfway. Is that you? Like my mom always used to say, too many people want to date Jesus and not want to marry him. She always used to say, people want just enough of Jesus to be miserable. Are you Zacchaeus? Are you Zacchaeus? I want to know you. You can know me. Come be saved. And that's the end of the story. Are you the second blind man? Started out as a public confession, followed with a healing, given the ability to have ministry, and never talked about again. Or do you want to be Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus? Healed, saved, sent, and obedient. That's the story of the final road. A road filled with people who could not give it up to follow Jesus. Many scholars call Bartimaeus the last disciple. Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to heal your mind. He wants to heal your emotions. He wants to heal you physically. Jesus wants you to be saved. He wants you to join his family. He wants to spend eternity with you. But if you go all the way back to Luke 9, when Jesus determined that he was going to head for Jerusalem, and those disciples, men came to him, I want to be a disciple. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. And he said, you're going to go to the nations and tell them about me. I can't do that. I can't do that, Jesus. There's something more in life. And we get that from blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus who went from a blind outcast roadside beggar to a senior leader and influencer of Luke and Mark. If you're here this morning, I want you to know that Jesus is more than a healer. He's more than a compassionate God. He gives purpose. He gives you a reason every morning to get out of bed. He gives you the opportunity to lead other people through healing, and other people into hope. He gives you the opportunity to matter and make a difference in your family. This morning, I want you to know that there's more to the story than donkeys and palm branches. It's purpose. It's salvation. 
It's healing. Bow your heads with me. I want you to just consider what I'm saying this morning. Just think about it. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Kurt, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't even know what you're talking about. If you're here this morning and you'd say you want freedom, you want healing, you want to be forgiven of the sin, you want the shame taken out of everything that's ever happened in your life, you want it washed away and forgotten, it can happen right now. If you're here and you'd say, Kurt, I need a healing in my mind, I need it in my emotions, I need a healing in my body, I need a healing in my marriage, I need a healing in my relationships, it can happen. If you want purpose, it can happen. If you want to matter, it can happen. If you want the power of the Holy Spirit to change your family, your community, your city, your country, this world, it can happen. Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you'd say, Kurt, I, I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. I want my sins washed away. And I believe Jesus can do that. If you're here and that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. But for every person in this room, I don't care how long you've been a Christian or how many times you've said this prayer, I want everyone in this room to get on the same page right now. I'm going to lead this whole church in a prayer, and we're all going to say it together. But I want you to say it from the depths of blind Bartimaeus. I want you to get down into the roadside beggars' blindness and call on the name of Jesus. Every single person. Say this with me, Jesus. No, come on, Jesus. Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Take my shame. I confess you as the Son of God. Be my savior. Be my friend. Be my king. Amen. If you said that prayer for the very first time, I want to meet you. This is your roadside moment. I want to meet you. Don't leave this place without me meeting you. I want to meet you. If you're here and you say, I need a healing, Kurt. I need a healing in my mind. I need a healing in my emotions. I need a healing in my body. I was told that people in Europe, they don't like to be called out. They don't like to be seen. They don't like to be recognized. That's what I was told. Bartimaeus wanted to be seen. Zacchaeus wanted to see. If you're here this morning and you need a healing in your body, if you're here this morning and you need a healing, maybe you're suffering from depression or anxiety. If you're here and you need a healing in your marriage, you need a healing maybe with, within your family, then you're going to need to be seen. And this isn't about Christian or sinner or VCC or Vienna or Europe. This is about humans needing a savior. If you're here and you need a healing, I don't care how long you've served the Lord, you're going to have to do something uncomfortable. You're going to need to stand up. If you need a healing, I want you to stand up right where you're at. If you need a healing in your body, you need a healing in your marriage, you need a healing in your relationships, you need a healing, healing in your mind, I want you to stand up right where you're at. This is your Bartimaeus voice. You are crying out from the side of the road. You are Zacchaeus climbing a tree right now. Don't let the discomfort of the dangerous crowd keep you in your seat. Climb the tree. Cry out from the roadside.
people are still standing. It takes courage to climb a tree. It takes courage to cry out from the roadside. Hallelujah. I can't possibly know every healing that's needed in this moment. I can't possibly know the intimacy of your situation. But Jesus knows. He is, as Anna Aleppo, he is seeing. He is looking at you right now. Jesus, I pray for healing in the body. Jesus, I pray healing in the mind. Jesus, I pray healing in the heart. I pray for healing in marriages. Pray for healing in relationships. I pray children would come back to faith. I pray moms and daughters and fathers and sons would be reconciled. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Lord, by my faith and the ministry that you added to me, I speak this in your name. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Stay standing, stay standing. Stay standing. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In this moment, the worship team is going to lead us in a song. I don't want you to sit. I don't want you to get out of your tree. I don't want you to come off the roadside yet. We're going to sing this song, and I want you to get down to the depths of that pain, those darkest places, that deepest pain that most frustrating moment right now, and I want you to call on the name of Jesus.